Okay, and with that, I will start. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Youth Fighting for a Nuclear Free World. Nuclear Weapons Free World. My name is Sarah Rolater and I will be the moderator this evening. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that I am located in Vancouver, which is the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. The webinar this evening is hosted by the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, or VOW, and Reverse the Trend Canada, or RTT. VOW was established in 1960 and is Canada's oldest national feminist peace group, focusing on various issues concerning peace, educating, advocating, and amplifying the voices of women. Reverse the Trend amplifies the voices of young people, primarily coming from frontline communities, who have been directly affected by nuclear weapons and climate change. This initiative embraces an interdisciplinary perspective on critical issues related to international peace and security and climate activism. As a member of both organizations, I am thrilled to moderate this panel and action discussion today. We will begin with presentations from our panelists, followed by a Q&A session and end with a presentation of an action item and how to get more youth involved in the nuclear peace and disarmament movement. With that, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Georgina Oroy. As a Malaysian Pacific Islander, Gina has chosen to dedicate her time and life to continue to fight for a better Pacific and protect her people. She has chosen to live her life by combating human rights violations to become a voice of the voiceless in the spaces of West Papua self-determination, nuclear disarmament, ocean protection, and a brighter Pacific, where the destructive issues currently they are currently facing in their region become resolved and eradicated. Gina is Malaysian and she will always choose to protect her people of the Pacific region. And with that, I would like to pass it on to Gina. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, like Sarah has uh, mentioned, my name is Georgina Ori and I come from the Solomon Islands and I am a youth um, uh, Pacific youth activist. And um, I am currently working for Reverse the Trend Pacific as a youth campaigner. Um, just a brief background on Reverse the Trend Pacific. Um, Reverse the Trend Pacific is a, um, consists of a group of youths all around the Blue Pacific that share a common determination to raise awareness on the twin existential threats of um, nuclear weapons and climate change that threaten the Pacific region and our um, entire world. Uh, we are currently implementing a project in collaboration with the Marshallese Education Initiative, which focuses on the universalization of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and raising awareness on the interconnection of nuclear weapons and um, climate change. Um, so um, I'm, uh, for this uh, for our webinar today, I'm going to um, just talk about my experience and um, as a Pacific youth activist and how I got involved into this space of um, nuclear disarmament. So um, I was first introduced to um, youth activism when I became a member of an organization called Young Solwara Pacific um, in 2017, when I was a first year law student at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. Um, Young, uh, Young Solwara is a Pacific youth movement that is um, comprised of regional artists who share common concerns and issues impacting our people and our islands. And um, we use art as a powerful weapon to effect the changes that we need and as a platform to amplify and vocalize our voices on the issues that we are facing. So it was also during the time that I joined Young Solwara that I first learned of the threat of nuclear weapons and its interconnection with climate change. Um, my first encounter with the issue of nuclear weapons in the Pacific was back in 2017, um, um, uh, when I uh, had taken uh, politics as one of my core courses as, a, as an undergrad law student. And in that course, we learned about the impacts of colonialism on the Pacific region. And this took us to the topic of nuclear testings in the Marshall Islands. And um, we were shown videos of um, jellyfish babies, um, babies that were born incomplete like jelly due to um, 
radio uh, radioactivity com active contamination that the people of the Marshall Island were um, exposed to due to the uh, nuclear testing. And um, later on in that year, in uh, in that year, I uh, met two two uh, young boys from the Marshall Islands. Their names are Ati and Apo, and um, Ati and Apo are two brothers born from a Marshallese father and an American mother, and they were the youngest Pacific activists that I have ever came across. And um, Ati was only around three years old, and Apo was around five. And uh, these two brothers were very young, but their age was not going to stop them from raising awareness on the human rights violations caused by nuclear testings on the people of the Marshall Islands. Um, they told me their stories, and um, one of the stories that they told me was how their mother would not allow them to eat the fish from their shores, from the sea, because the fish is contaminated by radioactive wastes from the Ranit Dome a dome located on one of the islands built and put there by the US to store nuclear wastes during the nuclear testing era. And um, Ati, Ati, even at that young age of three, also told me to call him um, Super Flash because he has, um, he has superpowers and that he was going to use them to kill the bad guys. And to him, the bad guys were the people that built that dome. And um, yeah, my encounter with these two brothers taught me a very important lesson. And that lesson is that the damage is caused by nuclear weapons um, and the nuclear testing is not an issue faced by the Marshall Islands alone, but an issue shared by the Pacific as a whole. And um, yeah, so history has shown us that our homes, our islands, our cultures and our very existence has long been used by foreign countries as mere testing sites um, or dump sites or places that they can just try out their new ideas for the development of their own countries. In doing so, we, the people of the Pacific, have not been given the treatment that we should be given as human beings, having equal rights as everybody else under the UN declarations of human rights. For decades, we continue to be at the receiving end of all the destructive activities that are being done by outsiders. The nuclear testing legacy of the US, France and Britain is just one example of the very many destructive activities inflicted on us. For example, Japan's current plans to dump radioactive wastes into the Pacific Ocean is yet another reiteration of the tendency of using the Pacific Ocean as a place not worthy of being protected. This should not be the case. The ocean is our greatest life source, yet global leaders have, no, have been reluctant to seriously address these harmful activities. The use of nuclear weapons has a direct effect on us in the Pacific, and it is very important for, us, for all of us to be united and work together to abolish them. Uh, the right to a healthy environment, healthy food, healthy water are just few of the very many rights that the use of nuclear weapons have long been denied us. Nuclear materials are weapons of mass destruction and they continue to pose a security threat to all of us. As a Pacific youth activist, I strive to raise more awareness on this issue because there is a huge lack of awareness at the present as well. And, um, yeah, one of the challenges that I face as a young woman in this space is um, the tendency of a lack of cooperation from government officials. Um, being from the Solomon Islands um, and as a young woman, um, there, it's, there are very few leaders that value the voices of youths. Um, therefore, with an issue that is highly present yet so unknown to the majority, it can be very tough to convince people that this is a topic worth discussing. And I have come across many instances where my requests for meetings with government officials have been turned down simply because the topic isn't part of the priority list of discussion. Um, and it is, but it is these types of challenges that continue to drive me to be even more determined and aggressive on putting the messages across. And we, so for us, we are not hopeless. For us, the Pacific, we're not hopeless. We are surviving and we will continue to survive just like our ancestors and our forefathers did. 
And one of the ways by which this issue um, can be addressed is through the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And this treaty would mean that there is a chance for demilitarization of the nuclear arsenals and self-determination for us in the Pacific. Um, it is therefore vital for all of us, not just the Pacific countries, but all the countries around the world as well to sign and ratify this treaty. Um, just um, final words for me as a youth who has access to platforms that highlights this issue. Um, I have committed myself to continue to amplify the voices of my people of the Pacific, and I do encourage other youths as well to get involved. And there are lots of ways that youths can get involved in the uh, nuclear weapons disarmament movements. And um, one of um, the, uh, the ways that they can get involved is by joining organizations like our organization, Rivers the Trend Pacific, and um, Young Solwara Pacific, Marshall Island Student Association, if you are a youth from um, the University of the South Pacific. Uh, okay, so um, do um, go on our website and um, uh, find the right information that you're looking for and yeah, do get involved. Um, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Georgina. Uh, thank you for introducing, reminding us just how vast this movement is and how much it impacts us in so many different ways. And with that, I would like to pass it on to Francine. Francine is a descendant of survivors of the catastrophic Bravo shot that was detonated in the Marshall Islands and is a strong advocate for nuclear justice. Francine actively participates in the Utah Marshallese Association and assists the youth in her community. She holds a bachelor's degree in communications from Dixie State University. Francine previously worked with the Republic of the Marshall Islands nu National Nuclear Commission as a communications officer, where she designed a social media campaign to raise awareness of the nuclear legacy in the Marshall Islands. She hopes to build awareness of nuclear and climate change in the Pacific region through more civic engagements. And with that, that I pass it on to you, Francine. Sorry, I wasn't um, able to unmute for the moment, but um, my name is Francine on Manta Malie Tulua. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I am a descendant of a person who was affected by the nuclear weapons that took place at the Marshall Islands. And I worked for the Marshall Islands Nuclear um, Commission and, and as of right now, I am the social media coordinator for RTT Pacific, um, as Georgina mentioned, with the collaboration for the Marshallese Education Initiative. And um, right now we are doing a campaign just surrounding um, the TPNW raising awareness um, within the Pacific region for Pacific youth and um, state parties that are not signed on to the TPNW and we have been hosting um, Talanoa's uh, conversations through Zoom and through Instagram Live. And if you are not following us, um, please feel free to give us a follow at RTT Pacific on Instagram, Facebook, as well as Twitter. And um, feel free to also uh, check out our page um, that was linked in the chat. And also feel free to um, look through uh, the Marshallese Education Initiative um, webpage as well. And their website is just mei.ngo. Um, and I just wanna introduce myself one more time. Um, my name is Francine and my grandfather was actually a victim of the nuclear weapons. Um, he comes from the island of Rangalabatal which is only 
a few miles away from Bikini Atoll, where the bombs took place. And the first nuclear weapon that detonated in the Marshall Islands was in 1946, and three years later, my grandfather was born. Um, when my grandfather was born, he knew of these nuclear weapons um, throughout his whole childhood. And when he, um, when the nuclear test took place, it was a social norm for him and his people around him. Um, keep in mind that when these nuclear weapons took place, uh, the people of Bikini Atoll were taken away from their homes and the people of Rongolaba Atoll, were, which was only a few miles away from Bikini, stayed in their island and at their homes. And from the first test, uh, a lot has happened. And from 1946 to 1958, the United States detonated 67 nuclear weapons on Bikini and Enoeda in the Marshall Islands, which forced a lot of our people to move away from their homes and making them stay away from what they know and what, which, would, which ties a lot with their culture. And a lot of our cultural identities were lost because of the nuclear weapons. And it is disheartening because to this day, my grandfather has not been able to return back home to the Marshall Islands. And one thing that he hopes to do before he passes away is to go back home. And my grandfather just turned 74 this year. And to this day, he still is fighting for his health and fighting for his home. Um, as many of you know, the Marshall Islands um, is a small place. And even though it only impacted four major of islands of the Marshall Islands, it didn't just affect the four atolls that many people discuss, but it affected all of the Marshall Islands. And if you were to ask, someone from the Marshall Islands, if they know someone that had in their family, immediate family that has cancer, most likely they will tell you, yes, my grandfather or my mother or someone in their family has cancer. And these cancers stem from the nuclear weapons and the radiations that stem from the nuclear weapons. Um, growing up, I didn't really know much about the nuclear weapons. I actually learned from the nuclear weapons from my grandfather. And then when I was in high school, I remember taking AP US history and learning about the nuclear weapons um, from a small paragraph in the textbook. And it was just a regular day in class. And our teacher had said, oh, during the Cold War, we took we did tests in the Marshall Islands. And that was it. You didn't hear anything else about the nuclear weapons and the testing that took place in the Marshall Islands. And I remember going home and asking my grandfather more about um, the nuclear weapons that took place in the Marshall Islands. And that was what made me want to advocate for my people and want to advocate for my, for my grandfather and for people like my grandfather was because it was on us to spread this story and to share our stories with others, to raise awareness and educate people about what is the issues that stem from the nuclear weapons. And um, in my senior year of high school, I decided that for my senior project, I wanted to research and interview nuclear victims. So I had the honor of going back home to the Marshall Islands and interviewing um, my grandfather's cousins that were also on, able to attend the Marshallese um, National Nuclear Victims Remembrance Day that, attend, that happens every year on March 1st, um, the anniversary of the Bravo um, nuclear weapon that took place at Bikini. And during that time, I remember 
looking around and seeing my community and not truly understanding how something that happened so long ago is still affecting us today. And it was from those conversations with my grandfather's um, cousins and my aunts and my cousins that made me want to learn more and advocate for my people. And I remember coming back home to Utah and um, giving my project in to my teacher and her and my classmates were all shocked and were very curious about how this could happen. But fast forward, fast forward to today, um, I was able to work for the National Nuclear Commission where I was able to raise awareness through social media. Um, even though I wasn't in the Marshall Islands, I was working closely with Ariana Taboin, um, Alson, who is a great speaker, as well as Do Dr. Holly Barker, who is now the commissioner for NNC. Um, and I was able to learn a lot um, from them and their experiences and all of the work that they push. Um, before the NNC was instilled, there was no education on the Marshallese um, nuclear legacy. And after it was instilled, Ariana Thaboyan was able to share her stories as well as share the, not, the education part. And now in the, within the Marshall Islands, there is an educational portion that um, teachers teach to their students so that way they can learn. Um, because generations like mine were able and my parents they grew up knowing about the history but they didn't know the severity of the history and I'm glad that I'm able today to be a part of RTT Pacific with alongside uh, Georgina and all of our Pacific youth campaigners to be able to raise awareness on not just nuclear issues but as well as climate issues that um, stem within the Pacific region and a lot of people think that when you have nuclear issues, you don't really see climate change um, intertwine, but they actually do intertwine together um, because Marshallese people lost their homes to the nuclear um, weapons that took place. They are now facing um, the challenge of possibly being the first refugees of um, climate change. And through a lot of um, Marshallese history, you don't really see a lot of advocates, but I'm glad today I get to see uh, a lot of more, a lot more Pacific youth stand up, um, whether that be in the Pacific, uh, Marshallese or the Solomon Islands, Fiji. I, I'm glad to see that our people are standing up and able to voice their concerns that are happening within the Pacific region. Um, and before I end it, I just wanna leave this quote with you from Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, who is a amazing poet and also a um, advocate for the Marshall Islands with nuclear issues and um, also the climate change. And this quote says, it's time that the next generation, our generation, picks up the torch from our elders and continues the fight for justice for our people. And with this, I just wanna leave this with um, our youth to today to not be afraid to speak their truth and not be afraid to speak um, out on what they feel like their voices will not be heard. A lot of our elders were able to do it and they've paved the way and now it's our turn to go and fight for um, our rights and our human rights. And I just wanna say thank you again for inviting me to speak. Thank you so much for your presentation. And you're right, it's something we aren't taught in school and we need to hear more of those personal accounts. And it's so easy to forget that people are actually dealing with the impacts of nuclear testing and nuclear weapons today. And that's, I think, what makes us realize how vital this issue is and how important it is to abolish nuclear weapons. And with that, I'd like to go move on to our final panelist, Avinash Singh Paul, Avinash Paul Singh, uh, 
who is majoring in biological sciences at the University of Manitoba, believing in the importance of continued youth activism in the nuclear disarmament movement, Avinash successfully co-led the campaign to have Winnipeg endorse the ICANN Cities Appeal in 2021. He is currently a board member of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Canada and the Manitoba Association for Rights and Liberties. And with that, I pass it on to Avinash. Hello all, and thank you so much, Sarah, for the introduction. So I prepared a presentation uh, for you all just to talk about uh, my story in the movement and to share some of the insights that I've gathered over the past few years of being involved. And uh, the work that I've done uh, hasn't always been by myself. It's never has been. It's been with people like Sarah, uh, groups like Reverse the Trend, IPPNW Canada. And so it's quite exciting. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to share that with you today. Just let me know if you can see my screen, okay? Can I get a thumbs up? We can see it. Okay, perfect. All right, so yeah, youth fighting for a nuclear free future. This is my story and this is uh, uh, pretty, uh, it, it does give the impression that it's been a stepwise journey, but that's not always been the case uh, at any point. Uh, it was something where we were kind of stumbled up on it having not seen enough education in our curriculums, but also given the opportunities to attend conferences and events and uh, events like these that I'm showing you on the screen uh, called the Peace Lantern Ceremony. It's, uh, it's an event that happens uh, every year in Winnipeg to commemorate the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so it's quite beautiful, rich in meaning where we prepare uh, paper lanterns and hear from each other, especially the Japanese community here in Manitoba uh, about the plight of their uh, ancestors not so distant that suffered from the bombings uh, in 1945. So to preface all of this, uh, as Francine also highlighted, there is a absolutely a lack of uh, uh, stable curriculums that talk about nuclear weapons, or some of them even barely touch on nuclear energy. And I mean, these are two transcending topics, especially in the 21st century. We hear about it all the time. It's kind of like a paradox where we have access to this information, but it's never embedded into our curriculums as youth. And that's a major shortfall for us. And my start in all this uh, didn't really start in the curriculums. It started from this event called the Youth Nuclear Peace Summit, which is a three-day intensive event that happened right here in Winnipeg at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, where there were over 100 students, most of them from our province, but we also had uh, folks from uh, other Canadian provinces, as well as from a few U.S. states uh, that came. And the whole point of that summit was for each of us, a uh, group of students representing our schools, to share a, a subtopic relating to nuclear weapons or nuclear energy. And so it could be the humanitarian impacts, the economic consequences, anything of that sort. And nowhere near enough the sort of things that we'd have to learn on our own. Uh, this was... Uh, a bit of preparation leading up to it, but also an opportunity for us to come together uh, to draft our first ever youth nuclear peace treaty. And so it's quite a fulfilling event for us and it motivated me especially and my friends uh, at the top left here uh, to continue doing something in our school, to teach the students that couldn't make it to the summit and to share what we learned with them. And the top right was just a, a wonderful group photo of uh, the over 100 students and of course many partners that made this possible. And I'm also pleased just to add that post COVID, we're looking at having more of these events annually. We recently had a Youth Nuclear Peace Day of Action last year uh, on October 14th at the Canadian Museum, of Rights, uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights as well. And we're looking to have this run annually, uh, also looking towards this fall. So much more news to come and we'll keep you updated as that goes. But this really marked the start of my journey into the movement. And underlying all this, of course, is uh, not new to any of us, that nuclear weapons are one of those sig uh, most significant threats facing us this century. And truthfully, disarmament is the only guarantee against their use, accidental or not. And we can't totally rely on the doctrines that it's, uh, we could say that, well, it's worked to an extent that we haven't had major wars. But that's, uh, that's a fallacy in of itself, in that we've come so close numerous times throughout our history. And it's only going to get riskier and riskier as we have more of these weapons laying around. 
And of course, on January 22nd, uh, two years ago, nuclear weapons officially became illegal when we had the 50th state ratification uh, that marked the entry into force of the TPNW. And so it's wonderful progress being made, but we still have a few more to go. And as of today, we have about 68 state parties and just over 90 signatories. And so we're barely scratching half, but we're definitely making progress. And of course, uh, educating youth, including them, is an integral part of that. And so post-summit, uh, like I said, we had the opportunity to share what we learned with our classmates back in our schools. And much more than that, this is when COVID came around and uh, there wasn't much of an opportunity to continue having in-person uh, events and, and that sort of activism in person. And so in another way that worked out really well was that we had the accessibility to uh, attend webinars, have Zoom meetings, and it was through that that a handful of us got connected with Reverse the Trend and the work that Kristen Chubanu does. And so we were involved initially as just uh, youth looking to make a change. And uh, we weren't sure where we would go next or what we would even do, but I think absolutely since then, there's been opportunities left and right in the nuclear disarmament movement in Canada and really throughout the world where we can connect with each other no matter where we're joining from uh, using platforms like today. So it's been truly wonderful in that regard given that we have this opportunity despite the challenges that we faced early on. And uh, it was something that my partner and I, Rosalie, uh, upon further brainstorming, uh, we really wanted to do something. And uh, of course, we identified some issues at first when we were young. We weren't quite sure how to navigate the system uh, to, to make a change. But we knew that with enough research and with the right supports, we could make it possible. And we landed immediately on an initiative called the I Can't Sneeze Appeal. And this is likely something that your major city in Canada has signed on to. Of course, we're missing so many cities from this list, and it's going to uh, expand ever on. Uh, of course, we already know the work that ICANN does, uh, but to us, this is totally new back then. And we also knew of the ICANN Parliamentary Pledge, which at that time, there were a sizable amount of MPs and senators that had already signed on. But we realized that there was definitely an opportunity for us uh, to advocate for our city to sign on to the city's appeal. And essentially, it's a symbolic pledge for the cities to commit to broadcasting support and calling on our national government to join the TPNW. And this right here I'm showing you is the text that our city uh, had to endorse. And I did mention that we weren't quite sure how to navigate it, but there were definitely a process for us to follow in which we would call upon our city councillors, uh, set up meetings with them, phone calls and presentations, and then eventually navigate the subcommittees to get into our uh, full council meeting. And at that point, uh, we would know if it was successful or not. So it was definitely a, uh, a process of understanding how to navigate as well as how to present the information. And it was also around this time that uh, I was connected with uh, IPPNW Canada. And it was when they were offering the first ever virtual internship program. The screenshot that you see on the screen here is just the second year uh, participants. Of course, we had Sarah, we had so many wonderful youth join. And this, like what Reverse the Trend and VOW offers is an opportunity for youth to learn more about what it takes to run an organization uh, focused on peace issues and nuclear disarmament issues, but also see from themselves what youth can do, uh, especially in leveraging social media support, awareness, teaching our friends and classmates. There's so many things for us to do, uh, given that these opportunities exist. And so it was just a matter of finding them and making sure that our friends knew uh, that this opportunity existed as well. So I encourage you very much to check out Reverse the Trends website and uh, IPPNW, uh, where there are opportunities to intern and work closely, as well as VOW, of course. And then just moving further along my journey, uh, I was able to, uh, again, work on awareness and sharing what I learned with the I Can't Sleeze Appeal, the sort of things that we came across in that campaign, where we could share with others who were similarly doing their own initiatives. So more recently, we had Sudbury join uh, through the work of uh, Mr. Richard Denton and the group over there. And of course, we also had Ottawa, which was a major milestone many years in the making, uh, endorse the I Can't Sleeze Appeal. So it's a long process. For us, it was relatively short, uh, but that was because we kept working at it and 
the process itself was kind in which things moved uh, a lot faster than we anticipated. And last year, we had the first ever meeting of states parties to the TPNW. Uh, this happened in Vienna, Austria. It was, uh, it was a hybrid event, uh, mostly in person though, and uh, truly wonderful for those that were long invested into the nuclear disarmament movement, but also for young people like myself who were uh, relatively new. And so Rose and Sarah were able to join in person. And there were so many things going on, including side events held by ICANN and partner organizations. But I just want to give you a brief overview in saying that this is instrumental in moving the TPNW forward towards further ratification. And my role in that as a young person was just to keep others informed and also work closely with Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, who is one of the few parliamentarians in Canada, uh, at least that's taking an active role in ensuring that our government is moving towards adopting the TPNW. So it's going to be a long process indeed, but throughout that, we're going to encourage our country to, to join, to at least attend. And this is a major focus for us in asking, where is Canada? Why weren't they in the room to, uh, during the negotiations for the TPNW? And why wouldn't they be present while other NATO countries were present to at least observe the 1MSP and the ICANN Nuclear Ban Forum? And so uh, in wrapping up my presentation, I just want to highlight then that uh, what I'm showing you does seem to be like a stepwise fashion in how uh, I as a young person was able to do so much in the movement but also just want to say that none of this was expected to me at any point. If you had told me even before the summit or after the Youth Nuclear Peace Summit in 2019 that I would be doing any of this today, I would be surprised. But in many ways, I think there is definitely more room to accommodate more youth. And the strengthening of intergenerational bonds is a key facet in encouraging more young people to join. So I've been very fortunate to have uh, partners in crime like Roj and Sarah and also the support of Senator Mary Lou McFedrin and so many other people that have lived through the Cold War who know what it's like to feel so anxious about when you know, further escalation is possible. And it's still possible today. It's just that we're not focusing too much on it as we should. So definitely there's more room for us to do more and encouraging more people to join. Uh, this is just a, a summary of the city council um, the story going back to the ICANN Cities Appeal. It was successful. And like I said, navigating that process was challenging at first, but the resources were available to us. And this is something that continues on today. There are similar campaigns in the country to uh, further on and increase the list of I can cities appeal cities in Canada. And in closing, I just wanna hand you off a quote uh, by our good friend, Shivane, uh, who is also uh, long invested like us from the summit to the present. He said in his closing speech at the Peace Lantern ceremony last year, it is in our hands that we take action to better our future. And uh, it's so much so that youth should take a lead, but also do it together with those that have done so much before us. And it's together that we make anything possible. So thank you so much for, uh, for listening. And uh, I'm glad to have been invited to share my story with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avinash, for your presentation. Uh, I've been with you for a lot of it, and I was so thankful uh, to be able. And we started in kind of the same place. And with there, I'd like to introduce myself a bit, a bit more and uh, some of the work I've been doing. Um, I'm a second year student at the University of British Columbia. And my path into this movement um, followed along a lot of the same trajectory as Avinash's, starting at the Youth Nuclear Peace Summit uh, and moving into reverse the trend um, later on. And then also as a youth advisor um, and intern for uh, Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, I was able with those two groups to attend the first meeting of state parties for the TPNW in Vienna this past June, uh, which was an incredible experience um, and left me so feeling so empowered and passionate about this movement, just being able to hear from survivors of nuclear testing and nuclear weapons, um, as well as the intersectional approach that so many people have been taking and the crossovers with other movements. It was just inspiring and how much I learned, I knew so many, Canadians, um, particularly young Canadians, didn't know. And that to me has been a large driver, uh, as well as knowing the humanitarian impacts and the fact that people don't know this risk 
is still out there as big as it is has been devastating and that's why I've been so interested in educating uh, more youth and I found that opportunity with IPP and WC this past summer um, working on an educational uh, webinar series which will be launching um, this February actually um, which I'm super excited about um, and I think this issue is so important for all of the reasons that all of our presenters today uh, stated and I continue this work with VOW and IPP and WC as well as um, RTT and as we move on I hope uh, to continue that work with these amazing speakers as well as more youth uh, that we hope to get involved and with that I would like to move into our question and answer uh, period uh, so I will be taking a few questions from the chat which will be read at the same time and the panelists will be given one to two minutes to respond to whatever question uh, or questions they would like. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please enter them in or enter them in the chat. Okay, we have one question. And comments too are always appreciated. Okay, we will move forward with that question. And as more come, we can launch into any others as well as youth or as our presenters uh, see them they can answer if they would like uh, so our first question what can youth do to pressure prime minister justin trudeau to join the tpnw why isn't he listening and joining the new treaty as well as we have another question how do you reach out to people um, I offered a presentation about nuclear weapons at U of Regina and no response. So if any of our presenters would like to take on any of those questions, as well as we have another one, can someone else post the oh, parliamentary petition? Um, that can be done. I will touch on that as well um, towards the end of our presentation, uh, but that link can be added. I believe we have it already to go. Uh, Okay, would any of our presenters like to start? I'll take a, an answer at the first question. Uh, it's extremely complicated to have, uh, to even understand what goes on in our um, Prime Minister Trudeau's mind in regards to the TPNW. We do know that from previous statements, at least on record, he did unequivocally um, in the same time show his support for the uh, you know, NATO nuclear umbrella also shunned off the TPNW and uh, dismissed it as being unrealistic. Uh, but in the same time, we know that from the work of his father, uh, Pierre Trudeau, that there, Canada has historically been a mediating role between the Soviet Union, uh, present day Russia, of course, and, and the US in regards to nuclear weapons stockpiles. So there are so many things that we can do in civil society, but they have to work in tandem with the parliamentary process that we have, which is uh, excruciatingly slow. And one of the things that we can do, while we can't directly pr pressure our any world leader to do uh, our bidding, is to work within the process to understand it. And something like the ICANN Parliamentary Pledge, which is a way for MPs to show their support. Uh, of course, we're not going to see anything from the Liberals, uh, from any Liberal MPs, I highly doubt it. But they're not the only ones in charge. I mean, we're in a minority government, and we can work within that process to encourage more signatures. And something like the ICANN Cities Appeal, cities are targets. And so we can make that clear to Mr. Trudeau, like what Ottawa did with the ICANN Cities Appeal. And so 
there's many things that we can do. It's frustrating at times in which you have a world leader dismiss something as important as this, but there's a process that we can work within and it just takes time and a bit of energy and momentum and definitely youth. Youth are an important part of the equation. Okay, we have some more questions that have been popping into the chat. Um, talking about the positive obligations of the TPNW um, how, and how we can get Canada to support these measures, considering Canada's position on the Convention on Cluster Munitions, as well as um, what is your view about expanding uranium mining and nuclear energy fueled by uranium and the threat of nuclear war? Uh, would any of our panelists like to take on either of those questions? I'd be happy to take a stab at any question, but I'd just like to know if my fellow panelists uh, uh, would like to contribute first. Okay, I think you are good to go. On the question relating to like the connection between uranium mining and uh, nuclear weapons, yeah, it's it's incredibly tough because uh, we definitely are facing twin existential threats with climate change uh, and nuclear weapons. And so there are renewables. Uh, we know that renewables are there, feasible source for um, um, meeting our energy needs. However, continued reinvestment into that would be very much needed given the state of our economies today. And so what we can look at is using the TPNW as a legislative tool internationally to move the conversation forward, but also in the same time, try to see, identify frameworks in which we can uh, make something like uh, total nuclear abolition make economic sense. And I think a root cause of that would be nuclear power, uranium mining especially, targeting it from that source is bound to have downstream effects in our availability of nuclear weapons. So. The TPNW is just one way in which we can move that forward, um, but we do have other frameworks that we can uh, work within. It's far beyond the scope of what we can discuss tonight, but yeah, those do exist. And it's uh, we do need to put people at the forefront, like what Francine shared about the people of the Marshall Islands that are, that are facing this. Uh, they're the ones suffering, and uh, it's all too easy to forget about that. So there's many ways that we can approach that. Hey, Francine, I believe you should be able to answer questions now, or unmute now. <laughs> so sorry about that. No, thank you so much. So I just want to um, touch um, base on the TPNW. Um, so on the TPNW part, uh, I think there are a lot of positives for the TPNW. It is just rather frustrating that um, countries are not seeing that um, with the victim assistance and things like that um for those who are from um, countries that are have victims i think that is really beneficial for um people but it's just trying to figure out how can we best assist them um just from our conversations through our talanoas we can see how um the tpnw is really benefiting for um state parties it's just on us to push for these um state parties to sign the treaty and um what we have been doing on our end is just hosting these talanoas inviting um affected communities to participate and we've been seeing that a lot of the youth have been um reacting by tweeting about it um also sharing about their their experiences and also uh demanding um, action through their youth groups. Um, Georgina mentioned the MISA for, for Pacific and they do a lot of advocacy on their end. And even though they're located in Fiji, they're doing a lot of advocacy for the Marshall Islands. And it's just for 
and I, I believe there was also a question on how how do we get you to join our campaigns um as it was mentioned by Avinash um to just check out our pages um make sure to share it with the youth so that way they can be encouraged to join it and tell them like hey how how have you uh learned about your nuclear um, history, tell them to check out our pages. Social media is a very booming right now. And for youth, a lot of them want to gain their knowledge through social media. So by engaging through social media, it'll help us reach out more to um, different audiences. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, we have to bring our Q&A session to a close. Uh, and before we end today, I would like to present our action item, a letter signed by youth to be sent to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, urging the Canadian government to sign and ratify the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Youth can sign a Google form, which will be posted in the chat and emailed to all participants that will allow them to add their name to the letter. The form will be open for the month of February and will be will close at the beginning of March. Uh, when the letter will be sent to the Prime Minister. So feel free to send it to any of your networks, um, post it on social media um, to make sure um, as many youth sign the petition as possible. Um, though there are also many other ways, as our panelists have discussed, uh, to get involved in this movement. Um, some ways are joining youth-oriented uh, groups such as Reverse the Trend or the Youth for TPNW. Um, watching out for internships like VOWS or IPPNWC's uh, summer internship. Uh, for many individual-led actions, some options might be to start a club um, or attend webinars, educate peers, um, or take on the I Can Cities appeal if you're really ambitious. Um, many of these activities will be outlined in a handy guide for youth um, that will be emailed with the recording of this webinar. Um, as I know, it can be very hard for youth um, to find ways to get involved and places to start. Um, and it also is hard to reach out to some youth. Um, and it's very intimidating uh, to enter a movement so big on a topic so intense. Um, and so this document will include groups to look at, action steps individuals can take, as well as resources to educate um, themselves with. Um, the petition or the Google form has been posted in the chat. Um, and I was also like to mention another petition um, that VOW has going um, to convince or to uh, have the government of Canada drop their deal to purchase um, 88 new F-35 uh, fighter jets that are capable of carrying uh, nuclear weapons. Um, we are <laughs> outraged at this decision. Um, and we have been working very closely with the uh, no fighter jets campaign um, to get the government to, to drop this purchase. Uh, that petition has also been uh, sent in the chat as well. So please feel free to send that around as well. Um, and with that, we come to the end of our webinar this evening. A reminder that the recording, um, a link to the Google and Google form and the letter and document um, that can serve as a guide for youth involvement will be emailed out to all participants. Uh, for anyone interested, we will be staying on for 15 minutes more uh, for an optional unrecorded discussion. And with that, uh, we would like to thank all of the panelists for your incredible presentations and for everyone for joining us this evening. And I hope everyone has a good rest of their evening.